Hey guys, how you doing? Is the light bothering you guys? Hopefully not. How you guys doing? How you doing? How you doing? I need to shave my beard. I'm looking old. First, last Protestant, everyone, welcome. <clears throat> I'm hoping some guy named John Murphy shows up. I went after him in my comment section. He's another arrogant know-it-all who thinks he knows the Bible. So, but thank the Lord Jesus for him because he's going to give me another opportunity to make an example of people who think they know the Bible, but they don't. Okay. So let's pray that he shows up. John Murphy, I'm John Murphy, I'm calling you out. Lord Jesus, loosen my tongue, save me from error, stammering, and confusion. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. I don't know who you are, battle truth, so why do we have to talk? Why is it very important? Smack your head. I don't know who you are. He was telling me that Anak and his ascendants are not Canaanites. So what I did was I copy and pasted a citation from Easton's Bible Dictionary. And let me just, for the record, clarify the point I made yesterday. Anak is actually believed to be the ancestor of Goliath. Goliath is a descendant of Anak. And the sons of Anak are called Anakim. And Numbers 13, 33, they're called giants. But they're not the only ones that are called giants. If you go to Deuteronomy 2, verses 16 to 23, mentions <clears throat> several other groups that were also giants. And I posted the citation from Easton's Bible Dictionary in the video yesterday. And I'll send you the link in a minute. Oh, okay, that's who you are? All right, well, you're going to have to wait, brother. Patience, my brother. We all have to learn patience. Anyway, the fact is, let me just clarify. I don't want this yet. Okay. If you actually read carefully, let me just clarify this. Anak is an actual descendant of Ham. And, it's, and if you look at the Bible clearly <clears throat> and the references clearly, right? If you look at the references clearly. He comes from the line of Cush and the descendants of Cush called Kasluhim. This is in Genesis chapter 10, right? Kasluhim. So Anak is a Hamite. His descendants are Hamites. They are descendants from Ham, so they're humans. And the other giants are also humans, descendants from Noah's sons. Now, the reason why I believe he's a Canaanite, let me make it clear, and I need you guys to hear before I begin in prayer, is because number one, he lives in Canaan. Descendants live in Canaan. So in that sense, they are Canaanites, right? They are tribes that live in Canaan, set apart for destruction. Hey, Guy, how are you, brother? Guy was reading those posts where I was very vicious with John Murphy. I'm waiting for him to show up. But I also believe that there would have been intermarrying among the groups, right? Can you imagine? You have a group <clears throat> living with other groups. And they don't intermarry. So <clears throat> I believe he's a Canaanite because, or was a Canaanite because not only did he live there, but there would have been some intermarrying with the Canaanites there. So though he is a descendant of Ham from Cush through the Kesluhim, he would have had some Canaanite blood. But even if, listen to what I'm saying, guys, even if you reject he's a Canaanite, he's still a Hamite. He's still a descendant of Ham. So if you want to reject that he is a descendant of Canaan, son of Ham, he's still a descendant of Ham through Cush from his seed, the Kasluhim. And he's still called a Canaanite because he lives in the land of Canaan. So even if you want to say, well, no, he's not a Canaanite <clears throat> by lineage. He's only a Canaanite because he lives there. He's still a Hamite, a descendant of Ham. You see the point? So this guy was trying to prove that I was wrong because he is a devotee of the late Pastor Arnold Murray of Shepherd's Chapel. Right? We just started anyway, Hafsa. So he ended up embarrassing himself. So now, guess what? Yes, yeah, Specklog, let me just share something. I had another brother named Howd, I believe, who told me that Chuck Missler and Arnold Fruchtenbaum believed that Nephilim, the Nephilim, are the descendants of the angels. And I said, yes, there are disagreements. We can agree to disagree. See, that's it. I, I thought I made it clear yesterday. I'm going to repeat myself. And I want to focus because what I want to do now, this is my prayer. And I pray this for all of us. I want to be more like Jesus in the way I worship the Father. 
in the way I live, in the way I speak, the way I communicate. I don't just want to be head knowledge. I want to be a doer of the word in love with Jesus Christ. And I need victory from the Holy Spirit over my flesh so I don't shame the Lord. Okay. I made it clear yesterday. You can agree to disagree with me. Don't attack me. Right? Don't come after me. But John Murphy, Murphy was stupid enough to pontificate in his repulsive arrogance. Oh, he's so wrong. And then he ended up humiliating himself. So I said, come on board so I can then make an example out of you. The other brother, Howd, didn't attack me, didn't say I was so wrong. He takes the position that many do. I know Michael Heiser, I believe, takes that position, as does the late Chuck Missler and a Jewish follower of Jesus, a scholar named Arnold Fruchtenbaum, that the Nephilim, Nephilim, are the sons of the angels. Fine. You can disagree with me. That's okay. I used to believe that too, but upon further reflection and in light of the fact that there were still Nephilim around during the time of Moses and even afterwards, because Goliath is a Nephilim. He is one of the giants. He's over nine, nine feet tall, six fingers, six toes. It is a descendant of Anak, right? So Goliath is a Nephilim. And there is no indication that another influx of angelic beings came to the earth after the flood to impregnate women, siring these Nephilim. No, Mickey, I don't want people to lose against me and I don't want to defeat you. You can disagree with me, Mickey. Just please don't attack me. Don't say I'm wrong and don't try to embarrass me and prove me wrong. That's not going to work. You mean Deuteronomy 32... Verse 8, right, Converse? Yes. So here I opened up the channel for John Murphy because guess what he did? He quoted 1 John 3, 12 to prove that Satan physically sired Cain because of his ignorance of the Greek preposition ik from the evil one. Oh, brother. Let's see if he's going to show up. Anyway, folks. I'll wait a few more minutes before we begin. Hopefully, John Murphy will show up so I can expose him publicly and have it on record to show people why you have to avoid certain individuals who masquerade as Christians and think they know the Bible. Gabriel, yes, anything is possible. But scientists who are materialists or are not Christian, Gabriel, will not posit that as a possibility. You get what I'm saying, Gabriel? Scientists will not posit that as a possibility. And then on top of that, by the way, this guy, John Murphy, says, see, that's why God is rebuking you. And he wonders why I treat him like a demon, like the dog used of the devil. Lord Jesus, have mercy on us. Wash us in your blood. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Yehovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yehovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yehovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Not so much that science was created by Christians, Jews, but some of the most prominent scientists who influence sciences the various fields of scientific understanding were Christians, but also choose Jesus. Not all of them were Trinitarian. For example, did you know that Sir Isaac Newton was, quote unquote, a devoted, devout, devoted, as Holy Spirit guides my mouth and saves me from error and stammering for the glory of Jesus. Holy Spirit, fill us and take over so that we can glorify Jesus Christ. Did you know? Because battle truth, you keep repeating the same thing over and over again, brother. If you be patient and stop repeating the same thing, I'll get to you. But if you keep pressuring me to give you attention, I won't. We got it. Just be patient. Sit back and enjoy the ride. Choose Jesus. Did you know that Sir Isaac Newton, even though he was a devoted Christian, quotation marks, and very devout student of the Bible, and wrote on Bible prophecy, he was a Unitarian who denied the Trinity and thought that Jesus was just a man. So would you consider him a true Christian? Andrew, our heart is in love with Jesus, and it's a matter of time he's going to give his life to Jesus Christ over again. Just be patient. So choose Jesus. When you hear Christian apologists saying that all these dominant scientists of the past, I'm talking about in Europe and in America, right? Louise Pasteur, so on and so forth. They were 
Christians. Yes and no. They profess to be Christians, but were they true Christians? In the case of Sir Isaac Newton, no, he wasn't. He was an anti-Trinitarian who opposed the Trinity and thought that Jesus was just a man. So though he was a Christian in label, he wasn't truly Christian. So I don't think it's fair and honest of, of Christian apologists to use him as proof that all the big name scientists or most of them or many of them in the West were Bible believing Christians. Why would I want to use him as a point where then someone who knows what he believed can say, oh, so you consider Unitarians true Christians who don't believe in the Trinity? Right? Thank you, Ontologics. I was going to mention Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson, because he was a Mason, denied the deity of Christ, and he was a deist, by the way. Right? I don't know how that works, being a Mason and a deist. As a deist... He didn't believe in a personal creator God who personally involved himself with creation. He believed that God created the universe and set laws in motion to govern creation and pretty much remained inactive, right? And Thomas Jefferson, because he didn't believe that God personally interrupted the laws of nature to cause miracles, that Jesus of Nazareth did not perform miracles, was not born of a virgin, and died and was buried. So Thomas Jefferson, could you consider him a Christian? He denied that Jesus is God in the flesh, denied the miracles of Jesus, denied the virginal conception, birth of Jesus, and his bodily resurrection. So that's my point. Be careful when you say these scientists were Christian, like Sir Isaac Newton, because he's mentioned. Well, Sir Isaac Newton was an anti-Trinitarian. He was a Unitarian, just like, what's his name, that heretic? Anthony Buzzard. Do you know that? Just like Anthony Buzzard, he denied that Jesus is God, denied the Trinity. You get my point? So do you think it's fair for Christian apologists to mention such scientists as examples of people who are committed Christians when they deny the Trinity, the deity of Christ? I don't think so because I don't consider them Christian. It's like citing a scientist who is a Jehovah Witness as proof that all these major scientific figures who shaped and influenced the sciences were Christians. But you'll find Christian apologists doing it. And I didn't know Sir Isaac Newton was an anti-Trinitarian because I heard Christians mention him until Unitarians start citing him as an example of one of their guys. Did you know that? You see my point? Abrahamic religion is garbage. Okay, okay. Chinmay, so Chinmay, can I ask you a question? Why are you here? If it's all garbage, Chinmay, why are you here? This is a discussion for people who believe in the God of Abraham and believe that the God of Abraham is real and has revealed scriptures to guide mankind. So why are you here? Why are you in a chat or in a live stream Unless it's for the purpose of attacking and angering people. Yes, guys, if you don't mind, thank you, Brother Sam. If you guys don't mind, would you guys covenant with me to pray Wednesday all the way to Thursday morning and fast for miraculous deliverance and a gracious decision that I don't deserve? That Jesus in his mercy will save me and set me free from these satanic shackles so I can devote myself to take, take it to the next level. When I say next level, just trusting the spirit, just to fill me, to become more like Jesus, to worship him more perfectly, to love him more perfectly, to obey him more perfectly, to act like Christ more perfectly, to study the scriptures with greater depth, <clears throat> to seek more wisdom and knowledge, understanding from the spirit, to understand the word of God and apply it and teach others for the glory of Christ and to be there for my daughters. Sorry. So if you guys would agree to covenant with me, you can start Wednesday all the way to Thursday, right? And let's see what Jesus Christ will do. I just need the Lord to set me free and ask the Lord for miraculous favor and blessing here. Folks, put, put, uh, put it this way. How do Christians fast? You refrain from eating and devote yourself just to prayer and worship. 
as the Spirit puts it in your heart, Hafsa. Folks, put it this way. When I have agents of Satan telling me the Lord is rebuking me, I don't take that lightly. Let me just, because I'm still waiting for a few more faiths to open, we're going to begin. I don't take that lightly. Do you know why? Let me tell you why. Because I know I'm a wretched sinner. I struggle with my flesh, and at times I succumb to my flesh. And my fear is to grieve the Holy Spirit of God, to be upset with me, to discipline me. Because the last thing I need is the triune God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, to be upset with me. The last thing I need. I need my God more than ever. I need the Father more than ever. I need Jesus more than ever. I need the Holy Spirit more than ever. Because apart from God, I cannot do this. Apart from God, I will not be able to stand. Apart from God, I am prone to fail. And so my prayer is, please, my Father, please, Lord Jesus, please, Holy Spirit, grant me your grace, your love, your mercy, and seal me by your infinite power to never shame you, never fall away. And please do not let me come under your discipline because I deserve it. Let me take off my jacket. It's a little hard. I do deserve it, honestly. Hold on, guys. If God gives me what I deserve, the honest truth is I deserve to go to prison. I deserve to be beaten and tortured. I deserve to be left homeless. I deserve to be disgraced. I deserve it. But that's why we ask God, don't give me what I deserve, oh God. Give me your grace, your love, your mercy, your compassion, and have pity on me. And that's what I need. I need the pity of the Lord Jesus, the mercy, compassion of Jesus. He has been my God from my mother's womb and he will be my god till i die and forever and i can't do it without him and folks don't think i like it when i get angry and i snap i don't there's a time and place for it but at the same time i want to exercise by the power of the Holy spirit greater self-constraint for the glory of christ right thank you mickey thank you battle truth if you keep Pursuing me and chasing me and telling me to call you. Brother, I won't call you. And telling me that you are a big YouTuber with 8 million followers. You're trying to entice me. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. Yeah, this guy just responded. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Let me tell this guy. Just. Hold on, guys. Let me tell this guy. See, this is what's sad. Now he says, oh, I can't come. That's why I'm going to block him. Anyway, that's okay. We're still going to continue. All right. So pray God, that God will give me his grace, his love, compassion, as he always has. And I pray he continues to do so, even more so for my two angels. Oh, here he goes. Here you go, John Murphy. I just sent you a text message. Why did you say you can't be here? I called you out. My friend John Murphy is here, guys. We are the champions, my friend. Now, guys, can you help me to help you and bless you to make, make this guy as an example of how not to interpret the Bible? Can you not interact with him and don't text him so I can deal with him face to face? All right. Are we now ready? Guys, can you help me? Do, try not to text and do not interact with him. Get the stock later. What do you mean get the stock later? We all have a job to do, friend. Don't make excuses. You were pontificating, acting like a tough guy, and said the Lord's rebuking me. Now let's see who's going to get rebuked. To show that you have no idea what the Bible teaches and you're parroting Arnold Murray. Because I know where you're getting your arguments from. Shepherd Chapel, Arnold Murray. You appeal to the preposition ek in 1 John chapter 3, verse 12, after you got embarrassed about Anakim. <clears throat> right? Okay, that's good. Now, John Murphy, since you can hear me, I want you to type in the comment section your butchering of the Greek preposition ek in 1 John 3, 12, because I want people to see what you are trying to prove by the preposition. And Protestant post for John 3, 12. Yes, I'm answering Islam. Uh, Ra Raphael, whatever you pronounce her name. 
folks, I'm going to tell you where these arguments come from. They were made popular by a gentleman named Pastor Arnold Murray. No, you're a liar. See, again, this proves to me you're not a Christian. You're a child of Satan. You are a liar. You have heard Arnold Murray or someone that studied with him because you didn't invent this on your own. Don't give yourself too much credit. You're not that smart. Okay. First John chapter three, verse two, verse 12. Let's read. Guys, let me interact with him. Don't interact with him. It's going to be whether Cain is the physical son of the devil. It says, not as Cain who was of that wicked one. Now, just to show you that this guy doesn't know Greek, he said that word of in the Greek is ek. The preposition was of that wicked one. And he's trying to prove that that preposition means that Satan physically sired, sired Cain. That's his argument. Okay. So John Murphy, I just want you to confirm to everyone that you're arguing on the basis of the preposition ek that Satan physically sired Cain. He had sex with Eve and she gave birth to Satan's physical son, Cain. I want everyone to see how stupid you are because I want you in your own words to say that's what I'm saying. So then we can begin your roasting. Come on. Tell the people, yes, that's what I'm arguing for. That the preposition act means because Cain is from the evil one, Satan physically sired him. Okay, block battle truth and send him on his merry way. John, don't waste my time. I know where you're getting your source from. You are of your father, the devil. You're a liar like him, and you're going to lie when you're embarrassed. I want you to confirm that you're arguing on the basis of the preposition ek in 1 John 3, 12. Okay, he just admitted. He just admit that the preposition ek exactly teaches that Satan physically sired Cain. Now, guys, are you ready for his embarrassment? Because I'm going to decimate the arguments of this child of Satan, and I'm going to decimate his arguments from Genesis 3, where he's going to appeal to the uh, the Hebrew word naga. See, the guy thinks I don't know his arguments. Yeah, in Genesis 3, 3, the word touch, naga. It's a euphemism for sex. See, this idiot doesn't know that I know where he's coming from. Okay. John 1, 12 to 13. Yes, we will see if you're going to use the Bible alone. He thinks that he is the only one who's come up with these arguments. Watch how you expose children of Satan. This man is not a Christian. He's a son of the devil. Maybe physically. Who knows? John 1, 12, 13. John Murphy, pay attention. Pay attention. Guys, don't text. Let me deal with him. John 1, 12 to 13. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood. Folks, the preposition is ek. Preposition is ek. Not of blood nor of the will of ek of the flesh, nor of the will of men ek, but of God. Ek, God, the same preposition. Now, John Murphy, you bring ass. It says Christians are born ek of God, out of God. How did God produce these <clears throat> Christians? How did God cause these Christians to be his sons? Sexually, did he have sex with their mothers? Because it's the same preposition. You appeal to 1 John 3, 12 and argued on the basis of the preposition ek. Let me now embarrass you in front of everyone. How did God produce these spiritual offspring? Because it says they're born ek of God, out of God. And this is the same John that wrote 1 John 3, 12. How are we born ek of God? Sexually? Physically? Come on, let's have fun at your expense because you think you know your Bible, but you're a child of the devil. We're waiting, John. This is my first example. This tells you, run from people who think they know the Greek and embarrass themselves. John Murphy, don't waste our time. How are Christians born ek of God, out of God? It's the same preposition as in 1 John 3, 12. Christians are born of God, ek of God, whereas unbelievers like Cain are of ek the devil. 
He thinks he is true Jesus. He's actually a son of Satan. See, notice, notice he can't answer. Did you see what he just said? I'm showboning. I'm an idiot. But this was the wicked son of Satan that came on my comment section attacking me, saying I'm wrong, and now I'm humiliating him. John Murphy, so you just admit that ek doesn't mean necessarily that someone was sired sexually. Thank you. So why did you appeal to ek? If we are born ek of God, not sexually, but spiritually of the spirit, how then can you assume that when it says Cain is ek of the evil one, that necessarily means physically and sexually, you moron. Okay, so why did you appeal to the preposition ek to prove that Satan physically, sexually sired Cain when that preposition is used in other contexts to refer to someone begetting someone spiritually, not sexually? See, now notice, he now ran from 1 John 3, 12. Did you catch it? Now, who appealed to 1 John 3, 12? This dog did. Now that I embarrassed him from his butchering of 1 John 3, 12, he wants to run to Genesis 3. Do you see why this guy is a joke? Let's go to Matthew 1, 18 to 20 to show you another instance of Eck. And now, guys, I can get rid of this clown, right? Now, it took me less than 10 minutes to expose this clown. So you agree, after this, he's a waste and that he's a dog barking on behalf of his father, the devil. May God grant him repentance leading to life. See, he can't handle it. John, I know you're a brain dog. You're a brain ass. I'm going to use Genesis to embarrass you. Okay, Matthew 1, 18 to 20. Folks, another example of Ek. Matthew 1, 18 to 20. We're going to read 18 and 20 and skip 19. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother, Mary, was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Guys, you know what the preposition in Greek is for of? Child Ek of the Holy Ghost. So Jesus came out of the Holy Spirit, Ek. Now let's read verse 20. And watch what I'm going to do to John Murphy. Watch what I'm going to do to John Murphy. Watch with Genesis. Just wait, guys. Be patient. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, the son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary, the wife, thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, Ek. Now, John, you brain dog. When it says Jesus is Ek of the Holy Spirit, that Mary conceived Jesus, Ek of the Holy Spirit, in light of the way you butchered 1 John 3 to your shame and destruction, I want you to tell everyone that you believe, God forbid such blasphemy, that the Holy Spirit got Mary pregnant sexually. Because that's what you're arguing about in 1 John 3, 12, because of the preposition Ek. I want you to say that's what you believe. And once you admit, no, you don't believe that, you just embarrass yourself and expose yourself for the biblical, illiterate, demonized agent of the evil one that you are. And then we're going to go to Gen Genesis 3, and I'm going to embarrass you. Watch, I'm going to end this guy's career by the grace of God. Sorry, folks, you Christians, if you get upset with me, you need to do this to people who in their arrogance and their satanic pride are misleading people by their distortion of the Bible because they think they're educated. Sorry. Engaging the enemy, you better believe it's good. Don't let me now quote verse after verse where Jesus, the apostles, and the prophets insulted people who perverted scripture, misled people, and opposed the truth of God. Okay, guys, pay attention. Mary conceived Jesus. He came out of her. Jesus was placed in Mary. Okay, so now, John, how did the Holy Spirit place Jesus in Mary? Spiritually or sexually? Because it's the same preposition. And it's analogous, by the way, to Eve and the devil. In that, Eve's child, Cain, is of the devil like Mary's child is of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to get there, John. John, I'm going to embarrass you. Just be patient, friend. How did the Holy Spirit place Jesus in Mary's womb? Spiritually or sexually? Sexually. Spiritually or sexually? Come on, John. You're embarrassing yourself. 
See, notice, he won't answer. Come on, John. Now he called me a sick, perverted bastard. Do you see? Do you see why this guy's a dog of the devil, a son of Satan? He's a joke. Can we get rid of this joke now? Have I sufficiently exposed this dog of Satan who pretends to be a Christian? Guys, we're done with him? Praise the triumph God. We're done with him? Praise the triumph God. All right. That's what I wanted to do. Now, let me explain why I treat people this way. And glory to the triumph God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Glory to the triumph God. By the grace of God, I'm able to discern an agent of the devil, a son of Satan, <clears throat> the moment he or she opens his or her mouth. The man came to my comment section attacking me, saying I'm so wrong at the Nephilim, and he ended up embarrassing himself, right? And so because of that person, I had to be as nasty as him and stoop to his level. Now, for the Christians here, let me repeat. If you disagree with me, fine. That's fine. In fact, there was a brother in my comment section named Howd. He told me he believes, like Chuck Missler and Arnold Fruchtenbaum, the Nephilim are the actual offspring of the angels. And I said, that's fine. There's disagreement. We'll disagree. You know why I didn't attack him? Because he didn't attack me. He didn't insult me. He didn't try to show people that I don't know what I'm talking about. And then in his arrogance, pervert scripture, exposing that he doesn't know what he's talking about and that he's of the devil. You with me there? So if you disagree with me, that's fine. Secondly, for the Christians who are not used to a believer insulting someone who pretends to be a Christian, folks, read your Bible. Read the Bible carefully. The prophets, our Lord Jesus, the apostles, did not hesitate to insult people, belittle people, humiliate people, mock people, call them dogs and sons of the devil when they perverted the truth of the gospel, hindered people from knowing the truth of the gospel, right? <clears throat> and or use the grace of Christ as a license for sensuality, sin, and immorality. I'll give you one example. Acts 13, 6 to 12. What did Paul say to a human adversary who opposed Paul's preaching of the gospel, putting obstacles before others? Acts 13, 6 to 12. So please, Christians, do not tell me it's not right to insult people. There's a time for everything. But I agree. I need to be more patient and loving, so pray for me. Acts 13, 6 to 12. Let's read. Okay. Let's read. And when they had gone through the isle unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus. So notice he's a false prophet and a sorcerer. Like John Murphy is a false Christian, a perverter of the Bible which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. So here's a man who wanted to hear the word of God, but what did this sorcerer, this false prophet do? Watch. But Enimas, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, Filled with the Holy Spirit. Guys, pay attention. The Holy Spirit fills Paul, set his eyes on him and said, all full of all subtly, subtly, meaning deceit and all mischief. Thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Now Paul is filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is filling Paul to rebuke and chasten this demon harshly. And then 11 and 12. And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Okay, folks. Did the Holy Spirit fill Paul to harshly rebuke a false prophet, a sorcerer, misleading people, preventing people from hearing the truth? calling this person a man who was a child, a son of the devil, full of deceit and mischief, and pray God's judgment on him?
So if he's filled with the Holy Spirit, please do not tell me it is not biblical, it's not Christ-like, it's not Christian to insult people, call them dogs, call them fools, call them agents of the devil when they're perverting the gospel, attacking the gospel, and attacking those who are seeking to preach it with integrity. Right? Pray I lose more weight and get my back. Clear? So let's put that to rest. Please, let's put that to rest. Do me a favor. Please stop telling me, don't insult. It's not being Christ-like. Yes, I'm not saying when I'm, I insult someone, I'm always doing it righteously because I'm a sinner. Sometimes I fail to honor the Lord in my anger. May God save me from unrighteous anger and make me more like Jesus in patience and love. But don't tell me that there is no place or no time in which when you can treat someone harshly, embarrass, humiliate them, treat them as the fools and the children of the devil that they are. Right? Is that clear? Do we got that out of the way? Everyone with me, because now I want to go into the meat of the matter. Okay. Let me repeat. Okay, send Rowan, Rowan somewhere else. This is not a channel for Rowan. He wants to preach his heresy, his doctrine of Satan as well. Okay, let me repeat. Let me repeat. I don't care if you disagree with me. That's okay. Disagree with me. But don't tell me I'm wrong. Don't tell me I don't know what I'm talking about. Don't come and try to prove me wrong, especially in my comment section. And one more thing, I've said it, I'm going to say it again. Okay. I said it, I'm going to say it again. Okay. Do not come to my comment section and post 50,000 word replies to me because you're going to get banned. I don't have time to read through your nonsense or arguments that are, I've already addressed or will address in my live stream. Save yourself and me wasted time. Okay? Yep. Save yourself and me wasted time. I keep telling people, and then they'll come and quote to me verses, like one gentleman, I invited him to come on. No, angels are not the sons of God, and he quotes the same passages that I've already addressed in the live streams, showing that none of those passages deny that angels are the sons of God in some sense. Clear? With that said, let's regroup. Help me to help you to glorify Jesus Christ by staying focused. Don't go on tangents. Don't ask me questions not related to the subject. Today's subject, as I promised yesterday, will be whether the serpent seed theory is true. Thank you, Andrew Martin. You with me there? I'm going to explain what the serpent seed theory is. Exactly, Angela. I don't want to be unnecessarily offensive, but I'm not here to win a popularity contest because if I go that route, God forbid, I'll start compromising, watering down the gospel to tickle ears. May Jesus save me that I'm not unnecessarily offensive to be sensitive in certain topics, but preach the truth in love. But at the same time, sometimes love can be tough, tough love. I don't know what Murphy said. If Murphy's getting upset, God have mercy on him. Okay. Are we ready now? Serpent seed. S-E-E-D. Okay. Can you help me to help you stay focused? Let's get the most of these sessions for the glory of Christ. Jesus doesn't need me. I need Jesus. And I am honored and blessed that the Lord will use me. And I pray that he has mercy on me. Lord Jesus, bless this session. Please. Do not reject us, Lord Jesus. Do not reject me because of my failures. Please, Lord Jesus, more than ever, I need you. We need you more than ever. I need your love, your compassion, mercy. My daughters need your love, compassion, mercy. Wash us in your blood, Lord Jesus. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus. Seal us by your Spirit. Fight for us. Save us from the evil one. Save us from his children. Save us from this corrupt world and this corrupt legal system, Lord Jesus. And anoint me to speak truth without error. And name will be by, by your spirit 
to interpret scripture correctly. No mistakes, no misinterpretation. Speaking the truth and the power of your Holy Spirit for your glory and honor, Jesus. To bless your people, Lord Jesus, who have joined me. Cover us by your blood. Cover my daughters by your blood. And Lord Jesus, make us more like you. And save us from our own flesh and from the world and from Satan and his children. We need you, Lord Jesus. Have mercy on us, please, Son of God. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good to see you, bro. What's that? You too, bro. Yeah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay, we ready? Lord, help me to get my health back. If you want me to be around, beatify me. Beauty of Christ. I'm getting there, folks. I'm much skinnier than I used to be. Pray I keep losing the weight. I'm getting there, folks. I haven't been able to hit the weights, but still, I'm getting there. Don't hate. Don't hate. Participate. Man, I got muscle memory. See that? Come on, ladies. Don't pass out. Okay. That's right. Okay. We ready now? No, that's actually coffee. That's why I got I have coffee-stained teeth. Okay, what is the serpent seed? S-E-E-D theory. Serpent seed theory. Are you guys ready for me to unpack this? You ready for me to unpack this? And I'll give you the history, my history with this doctrine, where I learned this doctrine. When I came to the faith in the 90s, I used to watch a man that used to come on the local cable channels <clears throat> named Pastor Arnold Murray of the Shepherd's Chapel. You can still watch him. He passed away several years ago, but his son, son, Dennis Murray, has taken over. Arnold Murray became internationally known and quite influential because what he would do is take every book of the Bible. How you doing, Vine? You missed an intense debate. And he'd go chapter by chapter, verse by verse, line upon line, using the King James Bible. And he still, his, his lectures and his talks are still <clears throat> replayed every day on the Shepherd's Channel. His ministry, Shepherd's Chapel, was from Arkansas. I forgot where it was exactly. But anyway, he passed away. His son has taken over, Dennis Murray. Quite influential, quite charismatic, a towering figure, an older gentleman. And he would impress you what seemed to be accurate knowledge of the original languages of the Bible. He's the one that I used to listen to at night. They would start, start showing his, his Bible studies. It's an hour. He does about 30 minutes of lecture, going chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and then 30 minutes where he'd answer questions, questions sent to him. And that was my favorite part of the show. So look for him, Pastor Arnold Murray. He's on YouTube. They have a channel, and they replay his lectures. And they have his son, Dennis Murray, who took, took over, also doing lectures. And it's quite influential. And his ministry has made an impact upon people the world over. And John Murphy is an example. He taught the doctrine of serpent seed theory, S-E-E-D, as Holy Spirit guides my mouth to speak truth without error. He also taught what is known as British Israelism, Israelitism. Now, let me explain what that means. Are you guys ready to hear? So I can deal with this because this is a doctrine out there. There are many people who believe the serpent seed theory. He believed that the nine and a half tribes of Israel, right? The 10 tribes actually relocated in Europe, particularly in England. And he believes that the British are actually descendants of the 10 tribes of Israel. And he believes that the throne of David is in England, so that the king of England sits on the throne of David. This is known as British Israelism, British Israelitism. You know how you have the black Hebrew Israelites? Well, you have their counterpart in the British Israelitism, British Israelism, Anglo-Saxon Israelism. Do you know that? So you have two groups, one Caucasian, the other black, claiming that the Israelites are either those who settled in Europe, not in Russia, particularly in, let's say, yeah, UK, and then they traveled to America, but then you have the other group saying, no, the true Israelites are the black and the Hispanics. So Arnold Murray was part of the British Israelism 
camp. He was part of the British Israelism camp, Brit British Israelitism. He believed that the throne of England is David's throne and that the kings of England are the descendants of David. You with me there? You understand what he believes? And I'm trying to accurately represent him. He then believes that Satan physically sired a physical son from Eve, Cain. He believed that the tree of the knowledge and good and evil was a euphemism for sexual intercourse, where Satan the serpent had sex with Eve, got her pregnant, and she gave birth to Cain. And the descendants of Cain are called the Kenites. Okay, let me tell you what he believes. Kenites, and some of them survived the flood because he believes that when the Bible says that Noah brought upon the ark to of all flesh, it also includes the flesh of Cain, the descendants of Cain, and that the modern Kenites are actually those Jews who think they're Jews, but they're not. Kenites. Kenites. Okay. And so he believes that when Jesus is, is attacking those Jews, he's attacking them by exposing their true lineage, that they're not physical Jews, they are the physical seed of Cain who pretend or pass themselves off as Jews, but they're not. And you have to know who the Kenites are to know who the true Jews are. You understand what he believes? Okay, so far you with me with what he believes. He's quite popular, influential, and many have been impacted by his teaching. John Murphy is one of them. Okay? You with me? So far, you with me. To, to add a little more to his weird beliefs, he believes that on the sixth day, God created et ha-adam, mankind in general, and all the human races in his image. But then on the eighth day, he created Ha Adam and Eve to dwell in the garden, separate and distinct from the rest of the human races. You with me there? You see what he believes? He believes there were two creation events in respect to humanity. He believed there was a six day creation of human beings where all the races were created on the sixth day in the image of God, but then God interrupted his rest on the eighth day to create a specific man and a specific woman for a specific location so that Adam and Eve are the eighth-day creation. Are the eighth-day creation. So if you were to ask him, he's now he's passed away, or you ask his son, Dennis Murray, or those who follow the Shepherd's Chapel, they'll tell you there are two creations in respect to human beings, two creation activities that God indulged himself in in respect to human beings. The first is the sixth day where God created mankind in general, and on that six days where he created all the human races in his image, but then God interrupted his rest on the seventh day and created a specific human couple, Adam and Eve, on the eighth day. So Adam and Eve are the eighth-day creation. Clear? You understand what he believes? Do you want to make sure... You get what he believes. I'm trying to be as accurate as possible in representing him because I don't want to represent him. I know Scott Free TV. I'm going to be dealing with that. And by the grace of the triumph God, trusting the spirit, I'll expose why these are false views. Well, Jojo, this is what made him interesting. When I first heard him, he impressed me because he would tell you, get your Strong's Concordance. And he would sell you a Strong's Concordance because at that time, the internet was was just catching on, right? The internet wasn't popular and didn't have all the resources we have today. So he would encourage you to buy a Strong's Concordance and then he'd give you 
the particular number of a word in Hebrew, Aramaic, or Greek. And he'd tell you, go and check what this word is in Hebrew, Aramaic, or Greek, and see what it means. And then he would dazzle you. He would dazzle you with his, quote, unquote, knowledge of the biblical languages. So he seemed quite impressive and convincing because he'd appeal to the languages. But then upon further reflection and study, it soon became apparent to me by the grace of the Lord Jesus, he was butchering the languages. Right? So now are you ready to go into some of his arguments? And part of my refutation is going to entail looking at the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek lexicons to show you how, right, he misapplied, misinterpreted, misunderstood these sources. And you saw an example of that today. Did you? Did, those of you who were with me at the start of the stream, you saw John Murphy, right? What did John Murphy do? He did what Arnold Murray taught him to do. Go to your Strong's Concordance, look at the word, which in 1 John 3, 12, what says, and Cain was of the evil one. That word of in the Greek is ek. And then quote the lexicon to show that ek here means that the evil one physically sired Cain. You saw that, right? For those of you who were with me at the beginning of the stream. I hope I'm not boring. I, I may not necessarily be entertaining, but I'm begging the Holy Spirit to make me educational, filling me with wisdom from his presence to bless you with the wisdom of God so you won't be misled. So, But you saw what happened when then I showed him examples of the preposition ek that backfired against him. But he was parroting Arnold Murray. That's why I said parroting Arnold Murray is not going to get you far, my friend. No, I, I'm just going to the book. No, you're not. You heard Arnold Murray, and you listened to Arnold Murray blindly like a parrot, and you took every word that he told you without testing all things like a good Berean to see where he was wrong, where he was right. Right? And you saw proof that I gave you that that Greek preposition ek doesn't necessarily mean that someone came out of someone else through sexual intercourse. Because I showed you in John 1.13, it says, we believers in Christ are born ek of God. We're born out of God. No one in their right mind, unless you're a Mormon, would say that God sired us sexually. And then it says, Mary had a child ek of the Holy Spirit. That child Jesus came out of the Holy Spirit in Mary's womb. No one in their right mind, unless they're blasphemers and dogs, would say the Holy Spirit had sex with Mary to get her pregnant. God forbid such blasphemy. Now, I'm going to show you a picture of Arnold Murray. His station, he's passed away, but his son has taken over. And it's more popular than ever before. His popularity has gotten more widespread than ever before. Here, let me show you what he looks like. Pastor Arnold Murray. Okay. Passed away. Let me show you his picture. Here you go. This is him. And I grew up listening to this guy. When I came to the faith, right? When I came to the faith, this is the guy I used to listen to. And he had a great impact on me early on. And thank the Lord by the Spirit the Lord show me his errors, right? Hold on, let me get you a link. Can I get a link that will come through? Hold on. Thank the Lord. Thank Jesus. He showed me his errors and I didn't blindly follow him. This is why you see why I am such a stickler and I'm so adamant about not just following anyone and everyone blindly, not even me. Here's the picture. I was trying to get you the link. Here it is. Okay. You need to trust the Holy Spirit. Arnold Murray's to the left. His son is to the right who took over. This is their website, their official website. Okay. You need to trust the Holy Spirit. You need to cry out to the Holy Spirit. You need to beseech the Holy Spirit, name of Jesus, to fill you, to guide you, to seal you, to protect you, to perfect you, and keep you united to Christ. Because he cannot fail you. 
He will guide you and preserve you by his infinite power. Okay? Are you with me there? I'll get to that back pressure. And this is why I'm going to encourage you. Please, for the love of Jesus, pray for me. That God will save me from my pride and arrogance that I think I'm God's gift to apologetics and teaching. Lord, save me from my wicked flesh that will keep me humble and teachable. And please, for the love of Jesus, don't follow me blindly. Don't parrot what I say. Don't accept everything I say. Take what I have to say. Pray over it. Study over it. And ask the Spirit to guide you. And to show me where I'm wrong and then to give me the grace to correct myself. Please, please, and I mean this from my heart. I know my potential for evil because I am a sinner. Apart from the Spirit, I'm capable of committing the worst sins because better men and women of God than me have fallen. Are you with me there? So if you love me, you won't make me more than I am. You'll beg Jesus to not allow me to shame him or fall, but stay holy in love with him. And you won't blindly follow me. Please don't. Please. Are you with me there? I, I want to truly be humble and not be lip service. You with me there? Do not blindly follow any human being on this side of glory. Do not follow any human being on this side of glory. We are imperfect. We are finite. We are limited. We are sinful. We are fleshly. We are pride. We are arrogant. We are. I am. I know myself. Let's not lie. And that's true of all teachers on this side of glory. Now, obviously, if I share something, I believe it's correct. Otherwise, I wouldn't share it. But because I am limited, don't know everything, I'm not aware of even those things where I'm mistaken about. But my hope, my trust is in the Holy Spirit. He is my God. He is our God, our Lord, our love, our life, our creator. The Holy Spirit is our maker, our sustainer, our life giver, our provider, our savior, our all in all. Because he is truly God, one with the Father and the Son. And we trust in him. So again, I want to encourage you. It is easy to admire people who are gifted. I used to be mesmerized by Arnold Murray. He used to mesmerize me. Robert Murray, who's passed away, mesmerized me. Even James White. I was mesmerized by James White. But God, in his grace and mercy, enabled me not to blindly parrot and follow anyone. And I don't want anyone to then blindly follow me and parrot me. Because then I am doing to you what I don't want to, want to be done to me. Is that clear? Okay. So let me again explain to you. I don't mind you disagreeing with me. But don't challenge me in my comment section. Don't attack me. Don't say I'm wrong. I don't know what I'm talking about. And try to then prove me wrong. And don't post 50,000 word comments because that way you're asking for a fight. Agree to disagree with me. Start your own YouTube channel. Do videos presenting your case and let people listen. Right? Is that clear? Am I clear? I just want to be clear so we can go into the meat of matters. To the meat of the matter. No, Shalom. Always cross-check because I can be mistaken. I don't have perfect recall and memory, and I'm a sinner that falls daily, struggles with my imperfections daily. So please, if you love me for the sake of Jesus, pray God will keep me humble teachable, and teachable and never allow me to shame him, disgrace him, fall into sin and scandal. Please, Lord, please, I'm afraid. Because better men and women of God have fallen. Just recently. Just recently. Just recently. Asking me a challenging question, Blasty, is okay. Waiting for me to answer your so-called challenging question is okay. But when I respond and then you try to bombard me by changing the topic, that means you're not asking to hear what I have to say. You're trying to prove me wrong and I'm going to embarrass you and muzzle you. And I'm talking about you in general, not you specifically. 
just recently, just recently, many influential preachers have fallen in huge scandals. Folks, that's a warning to us. We are not better than them. And if they can fall, we can fall. And in light of my trials, the things I'm going through, I know I am prone to falling and shaming the Lord. So my prayer is, I beg you, Lord Jesus, in your love for me, shield me by your blood, seal me by your spirit. Please do not let me shame you. Please, Lord. You know me better than I know myself. You know what I'm capable of doing. Please, Lord. So beg the Lord that David Wood, Christian Prince, Al-Fadi, myself, Vocab Malone, John McRae, Adam Coleman, Osama Dagdok, all these others, God in his mercy will preserve them, that we will not fail him, we will not shame him, we will not sin against him, and scandalize the church. Please. And in the love of Jesus, please, don't make us more than what we are. We don't need to be cult leaders and have a cult following. Please, and I mean this from my heart. So that's why I'm taking a moment to rant because I want to encourage you guys. Don't make human beings more than they are. And don't put your hope in any human authority. We will disappoint you. We will hurt you. We will break your heart. Exactly freedom in Christ. And that young pastor worked with, what's his name? He's a very famous evangelist in California. Man, I forgot his name. And he committed suicide. Right? So thank you for allowing me to rant because I, I needed to repeat this because I, listen, let me tell you how Satan's going to try to get me. Can I tell you how? But the blood of Jesus Christ will protect me and your prayers will protect me. The spirit will seal me. Satan knows that I have. Can I be honest with you? So we can get into the session. But can I open up to you how Satan's going to try to get me? Satan knows that I have low self-esteem. I have esteem issues. I do. I may look confident, but I have esteem issues. And Satan knows I crave affirmation, especially of a woman. Because growing up, I craved the affirmation of my mother. So he knows that. And Satan knows that I struggle with certain fleshly desires. So what better way to get me to fall by having someone affirm me and puff me up? See, I'm aware of it. You get my point? Satan knows your weaknesses and your areas that you struggle with. And those are the areas he's going to focus on. Those are the areas he's going to focus on. You get it? He knows I crave affirmation, especially from a woman. He knows I crave that because I didn't have that. He knows I struggle with esteem issues. Right? He knows. He knows me. He knows you. He knows humanity. He knows what our weaknesses are. And that's what he's going to capitalize on. So if you love me, and I know you do, that's why you're here, and you love one another. Yes, I do, Paul Anker. Let me just for the record say, can I say it? Look, let me tell you. James White is a dear brother in Christ whom I love from my heart. And I want you to tell him this. I love the brother. My anger with him, my disappointment with him, me going after him, and Lord forgive me at times ungraciously, is out of love because I was disappointed in some of the things he did and the path he took. But James White is a soldier of Christ who has issues like us, who struggles with certain personality <clears throat> issues, and who is constantly attacked across the board and needs the grace of the Lord Jesus and our prayers that God will sustain him. He is my brother, and he had a great influence in my life. And I told him, my anger towards you, Doc, came out of my love for you because of some of the things you've said, some of the, the things <clears throat> that you said about Christian brothers, sisters, how you treated them, how you went about criticizing them. But he is a brother in Christ. He is a soldier. He has issues like all of us. Okay? Right? 
He disappoints many people, but growing. That proves my point. He's human. He's a sinner. He has issues, and he needs the Spirit to seal him and sanctify him and protect him. And if we really love the Lord, do we want our brothers and sisters to fall in scandal and shame Christ, or do you want Christ to restore them and preserve them? Because growing, if James White falls, then the enemies of the gospel, the children of Satan, will rejoice and use that to attack the Christian faith. Right? So with that said, I went on a rant. Please forgive me for my rant. I went on a rant to show you why it's important that you do not blindly follow any human teacher. Because Arnold Murray affected me and influenced me so greatly, I started believing the serpent seed theory. This is why I started this discussion. Arnold Murray affected me because when he'd appeal to the Strong's Concordance, and he'd even tell you to get the Companion's Bible, Bullinger's Companion Bible, and I got it. I'll show it to you. I bought it from his ministry. I still have it. And then he'd tell you, go look at the appendix and see. And wow, he sounded convincing. So let me quote to you a verse, and let's go into unpacking the serpent seed theory. Proverbs 18, verse 17. Proverbs 18, verse 17. Proverbs 18, verse 17. See, now had John Murphy came humbly and telling me he disagrees, I'd have left him alone. But he's an arrogant twit. He was of the devil to cause division. Proverbs 18, verse 17. He that is first in his own cause seemeth just, but his neighbor cometh and searcheth him. You know what it's saying here? The first person to present, present his case will always sound convincing until someone comes and questions him. Arnold Murray sounded convincing until by the grace of God's spirit, you examine his arguments much deep, deeper and you find them wanting. Right? You see that? So etch Proverbs 18, 17 in your hearts. The first to present his case will seem right until someone comes and questions him. Right? And I try not to. I try, but I fail. Not to talk about issues that I'm ignorant of or I'm not confident in because I haven't spent the time hearing various <clears throat> opinions. So no when I speak about something that by the grace of God I have heard various viewpoints, various interpretations. So I'm not speaking in a vacuum or out of ignorance, right? Clear? Now pray we get over 200. My goal is to get to 300 viewers, eventually to 1,000. Okay, now, how do we dismantle the serpent seed theory? Now, let me repeat what Arnold Murray and others who follow him believe. And this argument did not originate with Arnold Murray. He did not invent this argument. He's parroting an argument that he learned from those before him. Okay? But the argument goes like this. The tree of the knowledge and good and evil is a euphemism for sexual intercourse. The tree there isn't an actual tree, but it represents sexual intercourse. So the serpent was inviting Eve to have sex with him, and then the serpent got her pregnant, physically with Cain, so that Cain is the actual physical offspring of the serpent. And they'll tell you that's why Cain is not listed in Adam's genealogy. If you go to Genesis chapter 4 and Genesis chapter 5 and 1 Chronicles 1, Cain is never listed in the genealogy of Adam. Thank you, Irene. Irene, God has blessed you with a sharp mind. You just answered the objection. What a brilliant sister, and I'm going to get to it. But first, let's see the argument. Are you now ready for me to refute the argument? Are we ready? Let's go to Genesis 3.3. 3. And this is where he tell you to check the Strong's Concordance. The Strong's Concordance. He'd say, now go to your Strong's and see that the word is Naga. And he would say it, Naga, holy seduced. 
And he's charismatic, by the way. Let's see what Eve said. But of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Ah, touch it. Okay, let's see what touch it is. I want to do what he did and then show you how to refute him. You ready? Okay, here you go. Here's the link. Click there. That's the interlinear. And this is what he does on his shows. He'll say, check your strongs. Okay, look what the word touch is. Okay, let me walk you through how he'd argue it. You'll see the word strongs concordance. Tegao, tegao, right? Okay. Then he'll tell you, go to the root of the word. Okay, there's the link. So the root of the word, if you look to your right, you'll see it says Strong's Hebrew 5060. So you click on it, and what's the word? Naga. Naga. Okay, this is what he would do. This is how he would guide you in order to indoctrinate you into believing that Satan had sex with Eve. So you go there, and lo and behold, it's the word naga. To touch, reach, strike. Now, in the particular strongs that he recommended, it would actually say that in a figurative sense, it means to have sex. And I'm trying to see if this particular strongs has that definition. Let me see. If not, I'll find it for you. Prime root, touch, naga, reach, strike. Guys, bear with me because the strongs that he recommended had that entry. So I'm using the online lexical sources. See if it shows. So bear with me. Okay, let me find. Oh, yeah, here it goes. Here you go. If you scroll down, it says Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. Here it is, right here. Strong's ex Exhaustive Concordance. Now notice what he does. Now watch here. Watch here. A primitive root properly to touch, i.e. lay the hand upon for any purpose, euphemistically, euphemism, to lie with the woman. See? Not Arthur Murray. Arnold Murray. Nasha, Sai Christian. Arnold Murray, Shepherd's Chapel, the guy that comes on late night that we used to listen to in the late 90s, early 2000s, right? So you see what he just did? He just showed you, you see? Naga, euphemism for to lie with a woman, to have sex with her. See, what Eve was saying is you can't have sex with the serpent or you can't have forbidden sexual relations. Do you guys see how he did it? Now, if you don't know the Bible and you're a babe in Christ, a babe in the faith, and you don't know the languages, this sounds quite impressive, doesn't it? And it catches you off guard and by surprise, doesn't it? Exactly. Naga would correspond to Nika, right? You, you catch it? Now, can you imagine a young, impressionable Christian who doesn't know much about the Bible? who goes to church and he hears these bore, boring, dry sermons. And then on TV comes this very, you know, towering figure, charismatic. He is charismatic, actually. Funny, too. Makes you laugh. And he says, let me take you to the strong, son. And I, I deal with the original manuscripts, the original languages. And here it's Naga. And he sweeps you off your feet, doesn't he? Right? Mickey, we're going to get there. You're getting it. See, Mickey, you're a genius. Mickey and Irene saw the problem. Mickey, I want to kiss your head. Mickey already spotted the problem, as did Irene. You know what the problem is with this view? You know what the problem is with this view, folks? It says that Adam and Eve ate of the tree. If the tree means... Forbidden sexual relations, particularly with the serpent, then this view means that Adam and Eve had sex with the serpent, so Adam had homosexual relations with the devil. So you guys got it. You see the problem? Genesis 3, verse 6. You guys caught it. You got it. That's why I say, Irene and Mickey, you're geniuses. God has blessed you with wisdom. 
wait, if eating the tree meant having sex with the serpent, but it says Eve gave to Adam. So Adam had sex with the devil. So Adam and the serpent had homosexual relations. You're kidding me. Here, let's read it. Genesis 3, verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired, to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So wait, both Adam and Eve ate of the tree. So both Adam and Eve engaged in this forbidden sexual relationship. So that means, according to this view, Adam had sex with the serpent. Serpent. Now you tell me this doctrine isn't stupid? No, Blasty, I'm going to embarrass you right now. Adam having sex with Eve was commanded by God. See, I was hoping an idiot would bring up that objection. Blasty, let me now nail you for being that stupid. Why would it be sinful for Adam and Eve to have sex when God ordered them to have sex? So it cannot be that Adam had sex with Eve because that would not be forbidden. You see how stupid you are? Because you're parroting arguments without thinking critically. <laughs> you see how stupid? See, I was waiting for that objection. See, he thought I didn't know that objection is going to come up. No, no, no. It's not that Adam had sex with Eve. Adam slept with Eve. Why would that be a sin? Yeah, and I'm going to call you stupid too, Boris. Get out of here if you don't like it. Oh, my goodness. How do you deal with an idiot like this? Being fruitful, multiply, doesn't mean have sex. Yeah, they're just going to look at each other and wait until Eve got pregnant. Hold on, Eve. Let me just look at you because you're going to get pregnant just me looking at you. You see, he just proved my point. He proved when you've made up your mind, no amount of proof will convince you otherwise. <clears throat> do you see that stupid response? Okay. You see the stupid response? No, no, you can't. You, you don't have to have sex to be fruitful, multiply. <coughs> so now, how could Adam multiply his seed, blast these spies, without having sex with Eve? Let me now indulge your stupidity. Blasty, how could Adam multiply his seed, his descendants to subdue the earth, without having sex with Eve? Answer that. See? Come on, Blasty. Okay, then don't pontificate. Don't argue with me so I don't have to go after you. Okay, Blasty Spice? I don't want to have to be unnecessarily offensive to you, but if you pontificate, you're asking for a rebuke. Who told you it wasn't supposed to work that way? You're telling me when God told them to be fruitful before the fall... That they weren't they weren't going to be fruitful through intercourse, but they're gonna play humbaya or you know, clap hands here, Eve. Let me oh yeah, touch you, Eve. So I don't have to touch you. See if I just touch you, oop, you're pregnant. <laughs> you understand why this position is now stupid? He's illustrating how stupid this position is. Are you guys seeing it, right? Notice when they can't refute an objection. Well, I don't have an answer, but when, when God told them before the fall to be fruitful, multiply, it didn't mean sexually. They didn't have to have sex to multiply. All Adam had to do was just touch her. Touch her in. Oh, you're pregnant, Eve. Oops. Blasty, in the resurrection, there'll be no sex because you won't need to procreate and preserve the human race. Are you serious? In the resurrection... Those who are resurrected are immortal, will not die, and therefore will not need to procreate to preserve the human race. But in Genesis 1, God specifically tells Adam and Eve in Genesis 1 before the fall, be fruitful and multiply. How did God design the multiplication of human seed without sex? <laughs> Okay, guys, do you see he's illustrating the stupidity of this position? Are you seeing it? Do you see? Blasty, God in his perfect foreknowledge, 
knowing what's going to happen before it happens, knew that Adam and Eve would sin and corrupt the human race. That's why already he set in motion the command to procreate. And besides, even if they're immortal, God doesn't just want one human couple on earth. He wants a race of human beings. So the fact that they were immortal does not <clears throat> go against the plain teaching of Genesis 1 that God designed Adam and Eve to procreate their kind. So how would they procreate apart from sex playing humbaya? So are you going to stop wasting my time? Because your position got busted exegetically. It's a perversion of scripture. Okay, Blasty. Blasty, do you want me to block you or are you going to sit here and listen? Because I'm, I'm going to be nice to you and let you stay if you don't chime in because you're embarrassing your position. Or are you going to keep chiming in so I can block you? Because your position is unbiblical. It's a perversion of scripture. Hold on. Let me see if he's going to sit here and behave and not speak. Hold on. Let me see. Are you going to stop chiming because you're embarrassing yourself? Right? So you see Genesis 3, 6? No, it's not discussing it. We discuss it if you have something valid to say. But if you're going to keep speaking nonsense, you're wasting all our time. This is not a platform for discussing nonsense where you just make up things on the fly and cannot prove your case exegetically. Otherwise, we'll be here all day. You see how Genesis 3, verse 6 destroys their argument? Because it means if they're consistent, and Blasty just gave you an example, they're not consistent. Adam had sexual relations with the serpent. But he knows that's stupid, so he has to say, no, 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 he had sex with Eve. Why would that be a sin? Folks, can I ask you a question? Since God already told Adam and Eve to be fruitful, which implies sexual intercourse, why would it be a sin for Adam to sleep with Eve? Thank you, Freedom in Christ. Freedom in Christ just brought up an excellent point. Why create Eve if he isn't going to procreate through her sexually? Everyone got it now? You see why that position does not make sense? It's, it's scripturally <clears throat> impossible to maintain if you're consistent. Notice, if you're consistent. Because your consistency demands that you argue that Adam had sex with the serpent. Let's look at it again. Genesis 3 verse 6. Let's look at it again. Yeah, Team Jesus, but notice two things with that. Just because Adam and Eve were immortal, they're the only human beings on earth. God wants a host of human beings, not just one couple to be immortal. So that's number one. So if they procreate and they didn't sin, their children would be immortal, and God wanted many immortal human beings. But beyond that, take into consideration, Team Jesus, God's knowledge of the future. Did God not know that Adam and Eve would sin? Yes. So he's already set in motion the procreation, the propagation of the human race in light of the fact that he knows that Adam and Eve will sin and die. But in order to make sure that their human race is not wiped out because of their sin, he's already told them to procreate before they sin because God knows the end from the beginning. You understand, Team Jesus? Do you understand the argument? Do you want me to repeat my point again? Because you see what they're saying? Well, Adam and Eve were immortal. Okay, let me repeat my answer to that objection. Are you ready? Let me repeat my answer to that objection. Thank you, Jonathan Simon. Just because they're immortal doesn't mean God didn't want them to procreate other human lives because they're the first couple. You think God just wants one human couple on earth? No, he wants the host of human lives, human beings. So that's number one. Which means if Adam and Eve did not sin, they would still procreate human beings because God wants a host of human beings that are immortal to live in his presence. That's number one. Number two, take into consideration God's omniscience. If you believe that God knows the end from the beginning, that means he already knew that Adam and Eve, out of the abuse of their own free will, 
would choose to sit and die. So God has already put in the measure of making sure that the human race doesn't end with them because of their sin by telling them to procreate so that though they die, humanity will continue until the end of the age. No, Blasty, you don't have questions. You're trying to prove your position and you're not learning. So if you're not here to learn, I'll block you. If you're here to learn, then stop interrupting. Do you want me to prove to you that God already knew Adam and Eve would sin? And therefore, before their sin, he already placed the command. He already put in motion the command to procreate, to preserve the human race from being wiped out. You want me to prove that to you? From the scriptures. Oh, okay. <laughs> Al, I hope you're bl being blessed and enjoying this because I think you used to watch this guy too, huh? In the late 90s, early 2000s. Revelation 13, verse 8. Revelation 17, verse 8. Let's hear. Anyway, if he keeps it up, I'll block him. If he wants to learn, he can sit and listen. Yes, Shani, he knew. Here's the proof. Revelation 13, pay attention. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of the life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Folks, can I ask you a question? Why would God have decreed that Jesus, our Lamb, would be sacrificed from the foundation of the world if God didn't already know from the beginning that mankind would sin? Revelation 17, verse 8. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they beheld the beast that was and is not and yet is. The book of life is the book of the life of the Lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. My question is, why would God have decreed that the Lamb would be slain from the foundation of the world if God did not know that humans would sin and would need Jesus to die for their sins? Why should he, Raphael? God wanted them to exercise their own free will in order to teach them a lesson and us a lesson. Why should he? God can do it the way he wants and according to his perfect wisdom. Instead of asking me why, deal with the fact that's how he did it. They are. Just because he knows something doesn't mean he compelled you to do it. So stop asking me these questions not related to the topic because you're trying to go into predestination and human responsibility. The fact is, this is what God allowed for a purpose and his wisdom and ways are perfect. And so he permits them out of their own choice to rebel against God and suffer the consequences because out of that, God would bring beauty out of ashes. So don't turn this into a discussion about predestination and human responsibility. We can discuss that another time. What I'm trying to illustrate is God knew they would sin and already put things in motion to deal with that sin. I was going to go to that passage next, Jesus is God. You beat me to it. But let's read 1 Peter 1, 18 to 20. 1 Peter 1, 18 to 20. Jesus is God. You beat me to it. I was going to go to verse 20, 120 of 1 Peter. 1 Peter 1, 18 to 20. So let's not change it into a debate about predestination and human responsibility. That's a topic for another time. We'll talk about it later. I can't talk about it now. 1 Peter 1, 18 to 20, focus. For as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, your futile way of life. Vain conversation means your useless lifestyles, which you inherited from your fathers, right? The customs that are useless and in vanity. But with the precious blood of Christ, you were redeemed by the blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, without spot. Now notice verse 20. Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Did you catch it? Christ dying as a sacrificial lamb was foreordained, chosen, known before the foundation of the world and now was manifested in time and space. So here's my question to every one of you. Why would God have foreordained, chosen, that Christ would be our sacrificial lamb dying to redeem us from sins before the foundation of the world 
before there was sin because God knew sin would enter the world. So that's why he put measures in to account for the sin that he knew would come to pass because of the misuse of Adam's and Eve's free will. Right? Is that making sense? But getting back to the point, so I don't confuse anyone. How do we know that the tree of life cannot be prohibited, forbidden sexual intercourse? Let's not lose the topic. The topic is serpent seed theory. Okay. How do we know that the tree of knowledge of good and evil is not prohibited, forbidden sexual relations? Because if it's referring to sexual relations, then the consistent interpretation is not just Eve, but Adam had sex with the serpent, which even Blasty cannot accept, which is why he's desperately trying to explain it away. Right? Clear? They're making sense, everyone? Friend, if original sin is sex, then we're back to Adam having sex with the serpent. Non-con, are you even listening? If you're not listening, don't waste my time. Right? Don't ask me questions not related to the topic because I'm not going to change the topic. Be patient. We'll address these questions later on. I want to focus on this theory and why it's not biblical. Right? What about the word naga? See, Andrew already answered the objection. Even though it's true that naga can be a euphemism for lying with a woman sexually, did you actually read the entry for that word naga? Did you actually read the entry? Though naga can mean touching a woman sexually, it doesn't always mean that. Just read the entry. Here it is again. The word has various meanings depending on context, but conveniently they choose that one meaning that fits their theory because the word Naga can mean just simply touching something. It can also mean metaphorically, you know, touching a nerve, right? So why is it that they choose that one euphemistic meaning and ignore the fact that this word can mean a variety of things depending on the context because they're desperate. Right? Here it is. Naga. They're desperate. This is what we call the etymological fallacy or the root fallacy. Let me explain something because this is going to help you how not to interpret the Bible. So are you ready to learn? Right. Are you ready to learn? So now here, look at this comment, how stupid this comment is. Read this. Okay. Some say, and Nathan is just repeating what people say. Some say the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was in the middle of the garden referring to it being located in the middle of a woman. So Nathan, let's say the tree is the middle part of the woman, her genitalia. Why would it be a sin for Adam of eating the middle part of a woman when God ordained for Adam and Eve to procreate through sexual intercourse? So Nathan, do you see the problem with that argument? No, see, Shalom, you're answering a question you should not answer. Don't let them bait you into answering questions. Now, because you answered it, let me explain. Someone just said, let me deal with this real quick. Guys, please focus if you want me to help you. Focus. Well, some say that eating of the tree of the knowledge of good or evil must have been good because prior to that, they didn't know good or evil. Who told you they didn't know good or evil? See, Al Dariosh, because he's a brilliant man of God. Notice he used the word touching metaphorically. Bro, these guys are touching my nerves now. Pun intended. You with me there? Okay, now pay attention. This is where you're not thinking critically. We, we take in knowledge through various means. Guys, listen to me. Did Adam and Eve know good and evil before they ate of the tree of the knowledge and good and evil? Yes, they did. Let me explain how. You can learn either by instruction or by firsthand experience. For example, I say to you, this is poison. Don't touch it. It'll kill you. So now you know by instruction not to touch this. It'll kill you. But then you go ahead and drink it. 
Now you know by firsthand personal experience it'll kill you because you drank it and you die. You get the point? Adam and Eve knew what was wrong because they were told to eat of this is wrong. So they knew it was wrong to eat of the tree by instruction. But they went ahead and ate anyway, anyway, and now they experienced personally the effects of good and bad. You get my point? So why are you getting hung up on, well, how could Adam and Eve know what was good and bad before they eat of the tree of knowledge? Because you don't even understand what the point is. They knew it was good to obey God and bad to disobey him by eating something forbidden. They knew it by instruction. But now they went ahead and experienced it firsthand, the effects and consequences of not simply being content to learn something by instruction, but now learning it by personal acquaintance and experience. You get my point? So who told you Adam and Eve did not know good and bad? The moment God told them this is good, this is bad, they knew it by instruction. They were told their sin was they didn't trust God to let him tell them what's good and bad. They had to go and experience it for themselves. You get it now? Is it making sense? So what was the abject lesson in the garden? You don't need to experience something for yourself. Trust me to tell you what is right and wrong, and you'll be better for it. When you say neutral, they're morally innocent with the propensity potential to corrupt themselves by disobedience. They were not immutably morally perfect. They were not immutably morally perfect. They had the capacity, the propensity to disobey and corrupt themselves. And that cap capacity will be taken away from us at the resurrection and the new heavens, new earth, so that we will no longer be able to corrupt ourselves, will be made immutably morally perfect. Thank you, Jonathan Simon. Yes, Paul Anker, why are you asking me irrelevant questions? No, they're created morally bad to be wicked and satanic. What kind of questions are these? Everything that comes from God is good. But God designed it that they would have the propensity, the capacity to disobey him and corrupt themselves. Okay, Paul Anker, I didn't know why you're asking. Lord bless you, brother. Okay. But is everyone understanding the point? Adam and Eve did know good and evil. They knew it by instruction. They were taught and instructed by God, doing this is good, doing this is evil. And if you do this, you're going to die. Their sin was they didn't trust God enough to tell them right and wrong. They had to go and experience it for themselves. You get it? Is it making sense now? Do you see how by the power of the Holy Spirit, if he illuminates us, the Bible is deep, beautiful, profound, and mind-blowing because it's truly the voice of the creator who exists. Exactly, first and last. Yeah, Armando, they didn't need to experience good and bad because what happened when they experienced it? They corrupted themselves. They became evil. They became tainted by evil, and they ended up dying. Had they just simply trusted God, then they would have avoided all this mess. I'm not done with Cain. Just be patient. I'm going to have to do intense sessions on this. But guys, you got two case studies of two people who have been corrupted and poisoned by the serpent seed theory. John Murphy, who does arrogance, got humiliated. And then this poor guy, I forgot his name. Blast, was it spicy? You see how many people have been affected by this doctrine? You thought I was lying, right? You see how many people are affected by this doctrine? We saw at least two today affected by the serpent seed theory. And that's just two of many. Right? 
No, it's not about predestination. Don't argue. We're not talking about predestination right now. Armando, I've already discussed this in previous sessions. Please don't make it about the trial, the knowledge of the tree of good, because God saw and experienced firsthand the effects of sin and rebellion. Right? So did the angelic host. They saw firsthand, they became personally acquainted with the damaging effects of good and evil when Satan rebelled. So, Armando, keep focus, man. You with me there? So, so far, do you see why the word touch doesn't mean sex in this context? Did everyone understand it? Everyone understand it? Everyone understand that in Genesis 3.3, 3, the word touch does not mean sex because then you're going to have to explain what does it mean to eat. Notice how deceitful this position is. They focus on the word touch, but they don't tell you what the word eat means. It goes eat or touch. So what does eating mean? How do you eat? Are you going to be that nasty and grotesque to suggest it is a euphemism for oral stimulation? You understand my point? How nasty and perverted this thinking is? You get my point? Because it says you're not going to eat or touch. So the touch part they're telling you is sexual intercourse. What about the eating part? What does that mean? See, they don't tell you. They don't tell you, do they? Right? Again, be careful of what's known as the etymological root fallacy. What is the etymological root fallacy? Where they find the root of a word and see what the root meaning is and assume that the root meaning applies in every context. This is known as the root fallacy, etymological fallacy. You do not define a word by its root meaning. You define a word by the way it's used in context and the definitions it's acquired by usage in time. Let me repeat that again. A word is defined by the way it's used in time by that particular group who use it. Get what I'm saying? So words will often have a primary meaning. But then it'll have secondary meanings and third meaning, meaning this is how this word is primarily used. But it's also used this way and it's also used that way. So in the majority of instances, this word has this meaning because that's how it's used for the most part. But when someone tells you this word comes from this word and this is what the root means, that right there is proof they don't know what they're talking about. Right? Everyone with me there? Do you understand what this fallacy is? Once they tell you, well, this word comes from this root, right there, they're exposing their ignorance. They don't know what they're talking about. And I'm going to give you English examples. English examples. Okay. The word bat, B A T. What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Exactly. What's the first word comes to your mind? Bat. B-A-T. Exactly, Billy Mandalay. Okay. Well, a gangbanger bashed in the head of a victim with a bat. A gangbanger bashed in the head of a victim with a bat. See, some of you said animal, flying rodent. But now in that context, does it mean flying rodent animal? What would what if someone said, well, you see, that word bat, when you go to root, it means a flying rodent. Therefore, the guy took a, a flying rodent and bashed this guy's skull in. How stupid would that be? Right? Thank you, Charles Dickens. Bat your eyes. That means you're taking a flying rodent and smearing it on your eyes. Okay. How about this word here? Pitcher. Not picture, 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 picture. What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Picture. Someone said baseball. 
Well, hold on. How do you know it refers to baseball or to drinking? What if I say the pitcher got hit with the ball in the head? So now it's referring to someone who assumes a specific role in a baseball game. I was in a bar fight and someone smashed the pitcher over Al's head. You see what my point is? You can't tell me the exact meaning apart from the context in which it is used. You get my point? You cannot tell me the exact meaning apart from the context in which it is used. You get it? So just because the Hebrew word naga can be used euphemistically as a euphemism for sleeping with a woman, who says that's its primary meaning or its main meaning every time it is used in the Hebrew Bible? Are you learning? Because I'm going to have to do a second session on this. Are you learning? Yep, homonyms. Exactly, Cruz. Fortnite, you can prove it by going to William Lane Craig, Reasonable Faith, and leaving my channel because it's not about atheism. Be stupid enough to ask me another question and get me off topic and watch what I'll do. So is that clear? Bah, they try to bring in another passage. 2 Corinthians 11.3. 2 Corinthians 11.3. Let's go there. Post 2 Corinthians 11.3. Just exactly, Jonathan Simon. 2 Corinthians 11.3. Here's where you're going to see the dishonesty again, the inconsistency again, right? 2 Corinthians 11.3. Yes, yeah, Cindy, it's a very prevalent teaching. Go listen to Arnold Murray. And if you don't know your Bible, you don't know how language works, he will convince you. Now, guys, pay attention, guys. Now, let's regroup and focus because you guys want me to address this and deal with this thoroughly. Then I need your attention so you can learn. So that you can refute this by the grace of the triumph God. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3. Notice another passage that's misused. But I fear lest by any means as a serpent beguiled. That word beguiled. Focus on that word beguiled. Eve. Through his subtly, subtly deception. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Okay guys. Arnold Murray. And those you learned it from will say. You see that word? The serpent beguiled Eve. Well, let's see what the Greek word for beguiled is. Okay, here is the interlinear. I hope you guys are being blessed, being challenged, and are learning to think more deeply, more biblically, to learn the word of God, to love the word of God, to live the word of God by the power of the Spirit for the glory of Jesus, because this is the word of God, and the God of the Bible is real. We love you. Hallelujah. Man, this Bible is amazing, isn't it? This Bible is amazing. The depth and its beauty. Okay, click on that link. See? Angela, your husband is teaching you the serpent seed theory. <whistles> wow, Angela. Talk about God's timing. Okay, now. That word, deceive. Exapatison. The Rasmian way of pronunciation. Exapatison. Okay, now. This is what Arnold Murray would do. Watch here. Click on it. Arnold Murray will say, go to your Strong's and look at the root meaning. Strong's Greek, 1818. So I'll click on it. Now let's see. Okay. Exapatau. Exapatau. And you know what he says? To seduce holy. Here it goes. And he'll say, see? The Greek word, exapatau, means sedu seduce holy. Holy seduced. You see? He seduced her sexually. And you sit there and say, oh, wait, the Hebrew word naga and exapatau. Man, he's right. It's all about sex. Why aren't my Bible teachers teaching me the truth? Angela, sister, please, for the love of Jesus Christ, keep it G-rated. And as a sister, watch what comes out of your mouth. We don't say bullshit. We say bull crap. But folks, let's be honest. You are a babe in the faith. You're a babe in the faith. You're green in the faith. You don't know the Bible and or languages. And someone says, see, naga, Hebrew, euphemism, to lie with a woman. See, Greek, exapatau, holy seduced. See, the Bible's trying to tell you in colorful language. 
Satan slept with Eve. And he's got you. And he got you, right? Yeah, I can do a better southern accent, Dale. Because remember how I was raised among Baptist preachers who were from the South? Y'all y'all, 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 ain't hearing me. Y'all ain't hearing me, right, son? Hey, the king ain't on it. The king ain't in it, son. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, 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 I'll deal with the original manuscript, son. I'll deal with Hebrew, son. You know Hebrew? Tohu wabuhu. Sounds impressive, doesn't it? Folks, if you don't know the Bible, sounds impressive, doesn't it? Right? Naga, exapatao. But here's where they don't read. And I'm going to prove to you they don't read. Let's read 2 Corinthians 11.3. They don't read carefully. Let's reread 2 Corinthians 11.3 and see how Eve was seduced. Exactly, Jonathan Simon. That's not mine, by the way. That's a let's reread, guys. Let's reread. You see how they sweep you by their dazzling rhetoric? Because, guys, let's reread. Read, read this, guys. The text tells you how he seduced her. But I fear lest by any means, as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, subtlety, man, this oh, subtle. He didn't seduce her sexually, he just seduced her by deceit. It even tells you the seduction wasn't sexual. The seduction was metaphorical. Do you see it? He seduced her by his cunning, his deceit. The verse went on and told you what exapatao means. Seducing her by lies. Seducing her by his cunning, seducing her by his deceit, seducing her verbally. Thank you, John Doe. And to prove it's not sexual, Paul says, I'm afraid. Just as the serpent seduced her, he'll seduce you, the church. Wait, are you telling me that Paul is warning Christians that Satan's going to have sex with you like he did with Eve? Because he goes, just like the serpent beguiled Eve through his cunning, subtlety, you too will be taken away from your simplicity in Christ. In other words, I'm afraid the serpent will do to you what he did to Eve. Well, if the serpent had sex with Eve, is Paul saying, I'm afraid he's going to have sex with you? Really? That's how you're going to interpret the word? Let's see how the serpent seduces Christians or will try to seduce them. Ontologics, you better believe it's with words. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 3 to 4. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 3 to 4. Here, 2 Corinthians 11, verses 3 to 4. Watch. But I fear lest by any means, as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, cunning, deceit, so your minds, not your physical bodies, should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which we ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, you might well bear with him. That's the seduction. It is intellectually, mentally, by preaching a false gospel, presenting a false Jesus that you put up with. That's how Satan is going to seduce you. By corrupting your mind, deceiving you into believing something contrary to the truth. It has nothing to do with sexual intercourse. Making sense? Making sense? But again, let me repeat, if you don't study deeply and you're a babe in the faith and someone comes who has a towering presence and is charismatic and tells you, go to your strong's concordance, the word touch there is naga, 
And it can mean lying with a woman, euphemistically. And then the word here, seduced, serpent seduced Eve in 2 Corinthians 11, 3. Exapatau. And it can mean holy seduced. And you don't know the Bible. You haven't studied it in great depth. And you just let him take that part of the text and ignore what follows. You see how easy it is to be duped and deceived. Right? You see how easily you can be duped and deceived. You got it? Is it sinking in? And notice what they did with the word exapatau again. Let's go to the link, Lexan again. Notice they again chose that one meaning that fits their argument, but, but ignore how it's used throughout the scriptures. Here, for example, click on this link again, look to your right, and it shows you where this word and its various forms appear in the New Testament. Romans 7, 11. Romans chapter 7, verse 11. Paul says that the commandment deceived me. Wait, Paul, are you saying the commandment had sex with you? Romans 16, 18. Their flattering speech, they deceived the hearts. Wait, Paul, are you saying that men, through their speech, had sex with people? 1 Corinthians 3, 18. Let no man deceive himself. Wait, Paul, are you saying that a man can have sex with himself? Do you see how silly? So why do they do this? Why do they choose that one meaning that conveniently agrees with their position but ignore how that word is used throughout the context of the Bible? Right? Clear? Do you see why there are two main proof texts? There are two main arguments. Do not prove their assertion. And by the way, how do they get around Genesis 4 verse 1? Because Genesis 4 verse 1 clearly teaches that Eve conceived Cain from Adam. She only conceived Cain after Adam had sex with her. Let me show you how they get around this. Genesis 4 verses 1 and 2. And this is Arnold Murray again, parroting what his instructors taught him. I like that, Roscoe. Sounds like a Matt Beer commercial or a deal. Watch here. And then I'm going to have to do another part on this session. Another part, because I'm coming down to the end. Genesis 4, verse 1. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived. Now, the plain reading of the passage, right? When Adam knew his wife sexually, that's when she conceived and bare Cain, right? Plain reading, right? Just read it. When did she conceive? When Adam knew her. Adam knew her. She got pregnant, gave birth to Cain, and said, I've begotten a man, gotten a man from the Lord. Verse 2, and she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. You know how they get around this, folks? You, you know how Arnold Murray and his followers get around this? If someone doesn't tell you this, and you just read the text, oh, so Adam knew Eve sexually, and that's when she got pregnant with Cain. So clearly, Cain is the offspring of Adam because he's the one who got her pregnant with Cain, right? They'll say, no, 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 no. Don't you know medically it's proven a woman can get pregnant by two men at the same time and conceive twins from two different men? So, yeah, Adam knew Eve. She got pregnant with Abel, but she was already pregnant with Cain from Satan. So she gave birth to twins. Do you know that? And it is medically true. There have been women who've had sex with two people at the same time and got pregnant by both of them carrying twins from two different men's seed. But folks, Genesis 4 verse 1 and 2 is clear. Adam knew Eve and she got pregnant. Adam knew Eve and she conceived Cain. They'll say it's not sequential, Jojo. It says that when she gave birth to Cain, Abel came out right afterwards. They're, they're twins from two different fathers. Do you know that? And folks, there are people now who buy into that. 
There are people now who buy into that because of the influence of people like Pastor Arnold Murray and the Shepherd's Chapel. See, Jonathan Doodle used to believe it too. See? And Jonathan Doodle, so did I in the beginning, but thank the Holy Spirit who was our God, our teacher, who guides us into all truth and saves us from our sinfulness, from false teaching, from the world, and from Satan. No, this is a view held by people like Arnold Murray. It's called the serpent seed theory. Right? Guys, you see how silly this argument sounds, right? I mean, to even hear it, it's funny, isn't it? You laugh, don't you? But you know why you laugh? You know why you laugh? Because the Holy Spirit is working in you and through you, and the Holy Spirit is protecting you and preserving you and guiding you to sound teaching. There are people that we're not better than. We're being deceived by this teaching, and we're no better than them. And you need to pray for them because you are not better than those people. It is the grace of Christ and purely his grace that he's saving you from his teaching and pray for the same grace for them if they have eyes to see and ears to hear. Right? Because I'm not better than John Murphy or this Blaze Pasty, whatever his name was, Blasty Spice, whatever his name. I am graced, a grace I don't deserve because apart from Jesus, and I say this again, apart from Jesus, I'm a wicked, carnal dog, a sinner who's capable of committing the worst sins. May Jesus save me from myself and save my daughters and fight for us. Please, Lord Jesus, show up this Thursday. I need you, please, especially Christmas is around the corner, and that you bless my children and bring us together in Jesus' name. Now, I'm going to do a part two on this, maybe tomorrow. Because, again, I have to find the time and the place to live stream. Thank our brother, child of God. This is his home. Sometimes I'm able to use my brother's home. But please pray for a miracle. Set free from the shackles of a corrupt legal system. Save me from this financial burden. Preserve the money he's given me to get on my feet for my daughters. Bring my daughters to me. And that this new year will bring greater blessings so I can go a higher level. In knowing the word with wisdom and knowledge and standing from the spirit and then living it for the glory of Christ and being used of the spirit to teach you for the glory of Christ. Christ is risen, risen indeed, and we love the Lord Jesus. Lord willing, if I can do a session tomorrow, I will. It'll be part two. But re-listen to this session because you've got two case studies of people who believe this doctrine who got refuted because they don't know scripture and they don't know sound exegesis. Pray for me. If you love me for the sake of the Lord, pray for me. He saves me and keeps me in ministry for his glory and provides the financial blessing. We love you, Father, Son, and Spirit. We are in love with you, Father, Son, and Spirit. We love you, Jesus. Bless us. Save us and our family. Save my daughters, Lord Jesus. And remind them that I love them in Jesus' name. I love you guys. I really do from my heart. Those of you who are sincere, those of you who come here to learn and not to attack, those of you who, by the grace of God, are able to put up with me, it is an honor for me to serve you, and I will gladly serve you for the sake of Christ until the Lord takes me home. I love you guys, and thank you for loving me, and the Lord bless you. Christ is risen, risen indeed.